chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody. And I've got one weird-ass collection of stories for you tonight. I have three tales here to share with you, and they run the gamut of horror fiction. We'll be starting our chimeric collection with I Found a Memorial of a Battle No One Has Ever Heard Of by J.H. Salem. I gotta say, this is a fun one, folks. This story wastes no time throwing open the floodgates and letting the monsters pour out. Grab your popcorn. Following that, we'll move on to A Symbolia by Michael Simons. Some might call this a life-affirming example of one man refusing to compromise on his personal goals. But I think that would be casting things in too innocent of a light. This one quite literally made me squirm, listeners. No joke. One hell of a ride, indeed, but one that might leave you wanting to take a shower. Lastly, we'll be closing out with Middle Class Christmas by Tim McDonald, as the Yuletide season apparently still has one lingering breath in its cooling corpse. While this is a rather short tale, almost more of a mood piece with tragedy at its heart, I personally think that it might be the most impactful of the bunch. Well, with a lineup like this, let's not waste any more time than necessary on the preamble. Buckle up, folks, and let's dig in. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now, from author J. H. Salem, I give you, I found a memorial battle no one has ever heard of. To those who fell in the Battle of Scarville, the stone memorial read, your sacrifices were not in vain. 
October 24, 1918 to October 27, 1918. Above the base stood a statue of an American soldier with a round cap and a long rifle with a bayonet attached. His face had a perpetual scowl, his eyes slightly squinted as the statue looked at something far off in the distance. I heard a throat clearing. I looked around in confusion. Beautiful memorial, eh? A voice said from behind me. I turned and saw an ancient-looking man in a suit. His face had so many wrinkles that it reminded me of a raisin. His ears and nose stood out massively on his shaking frame. I wondered just how old this man really was. Yes, it certainly is, I admitted, glancing once more at the shining marble statue, which seemed to glow under the bright summer sun. But what is the Battle of Scarville? I've never even heard of it. The stranger shook his head sadly at this. Most of you younger people haven't, he said gruffly. But my family was involved in the Battle of Scarville. I can tell you all about it if you have a few minutes. He motioned to a bench next to the statue, one that I could have sworn wasn't there just a few seconds earlier. I shrugged it off, though, admitting to myself that I might have missed it due to the glare of the sun, which was slowly disappearing behind the trees. We both sat down. He told me his name was Franklin, and I told him mine was Ted. We shook after we had introduced ourselves, the small, bird-like bones of his fragile hand feeling almost weightless under my grasp. And then Franklin began to tell me a story that would change my life forever. I was just a kid when this happened. My father was a soldier in the area, but he never liked to talk about what he did. Then, one day, he came running into the living room, his eyes all wide, telling my mom to get all our stuff, quick, it was time to go, and all this other nonsense. My mother asks why. He starts screaming gibberish about monsters and this and that and my mother says the strangest goddamn thing. Oh, is it that time again? Right then, the shaking starts outside. Oh God, it's too late, my father says, and he puts his face in his hands, crying. Now, my father was not a man who ever cried. I didn't even see him cry at my grandfather's funeral. He was made of stone one of the toughest men I'll ever know. So when he started crying, I knew something bad was happening. The sky started to go dark as if there were a solar eclipse. My mom grabs a canvas bag and starts trying to go around the house, grabbing some food and drinks. But my dad yells, saying we have no time for that. He tells her to grab his other gun, the 12-gauge, from the closet upstairs. He runs downstairs and grabs his rifle, shoving a magazine in it and standing at the door, straight as a board and as pale as a sheet. The sky seemed to go dark, even though it was still over an hour until sunset. Out of the darkness, I saw silhouettes, stumbling shapes with twisted legs, broken arms, long necks, and strange eyes. They continued forward at a much faster pace than any walking man. Their eyes seemed to glow in the dark, and the closer they got, the more hypnotized I felt. A strange, pulsating light came out of their faces, you see. If you stared at it too long, you would get carried away by that light. My dad, though, didn't hesitate for a moment. He started shooting as soon as they were within range of the 30 6 The nearest one's head exploded in a shower of dark blood. The rest of them began hissing like snakes and running forward. My dad empties his whole magazine, taking down six of them, then slams and locks the door. Where's that fucking gun? He screamed. My ma came running down the hallway with the big black thing in one hand and the box full of slugs in the other. He grabs the gun from her hand and gives it to me. You know how to shoot, boy, he says. Now is the time for you to prove yourself. 
Protect your family and home. By this point, dozens of those things are slamming on the other side of the door, still hissing and gurgling in some strange language I'd never heard before. I nodded at my dad and started slamming slugs into the shotgun. They were practically breaking the door down by this point. The lock had started to bust and twist, and the door was separating from the threshold. A couple more good hits, and it would have been all over the floor anyway. I know a good slug will shoot through doors. Hell, they'll even shoot through walls. So I point the shotgun at the door, point blank, and begin shooting through the door. Some of those things start screaming and falling over, dead. Exit wounds the size of grapefruits in their backs and chests. But the door was in a sorry state, full of massive holes and splintering apart. I had to reload, and they started busting through, coming into the house. Now that they were close, I could tell they were not human, though they almost looked human from a distance. But they had these strange, pulsating black veins going up their necks and stretching out across their faces, and their eyes were all the same silver color, glowing as if they had some inner light. It wasn't just a reflection like you see with some animals at night who run in front of your headlights. This light was coming from within them, and it was bright. Some of them had blood caked around their mouths, running down their clothes and the entire fronts of their bodies. Whose blood, I didn't yet know. But when I saw the casualties in the town later on, I would figure it out. Just when I thought we would be overwhelmed, my neighbor and some of his family members ran over. He started screaming at me from the yard, firing his gun at the creatures in a frenzy of violence. He had his two sons with him, and they all had shotguns. They were whooping and hollering, blowing the creatures apart with buckshot. When one of them stopped to reload, the other two would cover them, so they had a nearly constant rate of fire. My dad and I ran out the door, shooting and reloading. I saw the skull of the nearest creature disintegrate as I fired into its head from less than five feet away. But its eyes seemed to hover in the air a moment after it was gone. It reminded me of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland, how its face seemed to hang in the air after its body had gone. By this point, we had finished off the entire group of them. A couple of dozen bodies lay around us. My heart was beating and my blood was up. I could almost relate to my neighbor's sons. Part of me wanted to whoop and holler too. Part of it was fun and exciting, even though I knew that one wrong move would likely mean death. I used the break in the action to move closer to one of the corpses and look at it. In its basic shape, it looked human, but up close you could tell it was no such thing. For one thing, they all had six fingers on each hand and were twisted long things. They almost looked vampiric, and, as I would find out later, that was right on the money or at least as close to it as we could understand. Their skin had thin black veins running every which way, and they appeared to all be wearing some sort of coarse brown cloth formed into shapeless pants and shirts. They even covered their feet with it, though they had some sort of leather on the bottom. It didn't look like any leather I'd ever seen, however. It shone and shimmered, and it looked inflexible and thick. It looked chitinous. Out in the field, we heard a sound like a screaming woman. It broke the silence and caused us all to jump, spinning around and pointing our guns. But what we saw there was no scared lady. It was some sort of animal standing over ten feet tall. It looked like some huge praying mantis except its hide was shiny and black. I reckon that massive pinchers extended from the front of its face, 
big enough to chop a man in half down the middle. The eyes were huge and black, but as the light moved across them, they seemed to shimmer like rainbows. What in God's name is that? My dad yelled, but the neighbors only shook their heads in amazement. Then one of the boys, a red-headed and skinny lad named Wesley, said something that caught me off guard. I saw some of those things coming out of the caves, he said. I looked at him, eyes wide, and so did everyone else. When I was fishing earlier at the stream, I first thought it was just people exploring the tunnels until I saw their eyes and those veins. His father grabbed his shoulder and shook him. When was it? His father asked him, looking scared and uncertain. How long ago, son? His son shook his head slowly, trying to remember. An hour ago, maybe, Wesley said. As soon as I saw them, I started running home. And not five minutes after I got there, they started coming across the yard. People from town were running down the road now, screaming in terror and pain. I saw them driven on like herds of sheep, and our giant praying mantis friend also noticed. Its head went up, antenna flicking, head cocked to the side in a way that would have been comical in other circumstances. Its pinchers moved faster, opening and closing constantly, as if it were trying to taste the air. Then it started running. It was just a black blur in the dim light, flying across the yard at an impossible speed. I couldn't even see its legs moving. It grabbed the nearest person, a young woman with huge, terrified eyes, and used its pinchers to snap her head right off. The decapitated head rolled across the ground, an expression of mortal terror still etched into her face. Then the mantis creature began to suck at the bleeding stump of her neck, drinking until it looked like the body was sucking in on itself, until the skin was pale and bloodless as a mannequin. The other people were stumbling and running around it, still praying, cursing, and shrieking, but it took no notice of them. Once it was full, it looked bigger, more swelled up like a tick. Its chitinous black shell seemed to expand, looked more rounded, and it even looked a little more red in the pale light, as if the blackness of its hide had lightened into a shade of darkest crimson. Vampires are invading us, I screamed. Everyone looked at me, but no one argued. They didn't even have time to. At that moment, the next wave started. Our home was on a road with houses every few hundred feet, a forest behind the houses and a grassy field on the other side. The road itself sat between the field and the homes. The trees pressed in on the houses, being only twenty or thirty feet behind them. The woods were old and thick with brush and prickers and endless ferns. It was hard enough to see in it in the daytime, but it was now nearly night, and trying to see into it was a fool's errand. The enemy used our disadvantage to surprise us. We had all reloaded, of course, and we had five men with guns. I wished I had another one to give to my ma, who stood behind my dad, both of them looking scared and far too pale. I saw it was the mantis creatures that were approaching, though a few of the vampires walked through silently, their eyes glowing. The two apex predators didn't seem inclined to attack each other. I wondered if the vampires had somehow domesticated the giant mantis creatures. It didn't seem likely, but who knew? We started shooting as soon as they broke the boundary of the woods. The mantis creatures shrieked like dying women, 
emitting deafening wails as their legs, chests, and heads were blown apart by shotgun and rifle fire. But more and more kept coming, and some were now coming from the field and road as well. We were slowly being surrounded, and our ammo was not unlimited. A vampire ran at my mother. I saw it in slow motion, the creature popping up from the grassy field and sprinting. My father was busy firing that rifle like a madman, trying to keep the mantis creatures from overtaking us. I knew it was a hopeless task, but I could at least save my ma. I raised the shotgun, the vampire only a few feet away from me now, and shot it point blank in the face. Its head disintegrated into a mask of gore, droplets of blood flying. My mouth had been open. I was breathing hard, terrified and in the middle of battle fever, you see, and a few droplets of that strange dark blood splattered directly into my mouth. I hadn't even realized what had happened until I tasted it. It tasted nothing at all like human blood, nothing like sucking on a cut thumb after a small injury, nothing like the taste of a bloody rare steak. No, this blood was sweet and somehow cloying. It was an artificial sweetness, like some fake sugar you might put in a coffee, combined with a vague metallic aftertaste. I started to spit after realizing what had happened, but by then, we were being overrun. My neighbor was ripped apart in front of me, his old, weather-beaten face showing a final expression of shock and horror as a mantis bit him across his body, right where his heart lay. Blood spurted from the wound. The mantis gingerly pushed the body parts apart, and began to suck at the blood from the spurting injuries. Another followed silently behind and started feeding on the other half. I watched it all in horror, until a hand grabbed my shoulder. I spun and saw Wesley. We need to go, now, he said, pulling me. My dad, Ma, and the others. I screamed. He shook his head. He was closest to me. As we became overrun, the creatures had split us into smaller groups. Wesley's brother and my ma and dad were among them. We had at least five mantis creatures and a few more vampires between us. As dozens more came running towards us, towards the commotion and the prospect of a warm meal, I realized Wesley was right. But I fired all the same taking down one of the mantis creatures with a slug to the torso. Its dark blood covered the dirt as it squealed and fell over, kicking its legs slowly and rhythmically like a flipped turtle as it died. My dad and Wesley's brother were still shooting. I thanked God that we each had a sack of ammo, but mine was feeling light. I looked down and saw only a dozen more slugs, maybe, They must be getting low, too. I knew I would have to return for them when things calmed down, but for now, I fled. Wesley ran ahead of me, his coarse work clothes flapping in the wind. We sprinted across the yard. I looked back and saw one of the mantis creatures running us down, moving much faster than we could ever hope to run. I stopped, turning. It felt like I was facing down a charging train. I raised the gun, and with a shot to the head, I dropped it only ten feet away from me. It kept running for a second, a body without any brain to run it, and then it began to fall forward, sliding, its legs kicking and trembling as it died. Wesley had a shelter behind his house, It was little more than a root cellar in the backyard of his house, but it was hidden underground. He pulled the latch on the hatchway, opening it and motioning for me to go first. I ran forward, climbing down the short ladder. He followed, 
keeping the hatchway open for light while he started a gas lamp with some flint. Once we were situated, he closed the hatch. It was able to be locked from the inside and was reinforced against tornadoes, with wood and concrete forming the walls. We also had some supplies, water, jars of pickled foods, and jerky. Not much variety, but it would do. We stayed down there for two days. When we came back up, the creatures were gone. They had even taken their dead with them. I didn't know where they had gone, though I assumed it was back into the caves. They had left our dead, however. Countless bodies lay all around the surrounding towns. I saw endless dead in the downtown area when I went down there, and I never saw my dad or ma again. I never even found their bodies. Perhaps they had been dragged off into the woods, or perhaps the creatures took a few bodies back with them, maybe as souvenirs, or maybe just for some fresh meat. All of the people who died in the Battle of Scarville were reported as casualties from the Great War or the Spanish Flu. But those of us who were there know what we saw, and these were no flu victims. Thousands of bodies around the town had all the blood drained from them. I wonder why those creatures from underground didn't keep going. After all, they had won the Battle of Scarville, which was really just more of a massacre. But then I thought about how deer hunters are only allowed to hunt so many per season to allow their population to regrow every year. And I thought about those abominations under the earth, and I wondered if maybe, just maybe they might be doing the same to us waiting for the human population to grow for a hundred years or so. Then, when the population is fat and healthy and lazy, come back out to feed on the herd. The old man stopped, clearing his throat and looking over at me. His story had apparently come to an end. He smiled slightly at me, but I kept looking at him suspiciously, waiting for some sort of punchline. You realize how insane that whole story sounds? I asked after a few moments. The old man, with his withered face, just grinned at me. And in the dying light of the setting sun, I could have sworn his eyes were glowing. You've been listening to I Found a Memorial Battle No One Has Ever Heard Of by J. H. Salem. J. H. Salem is a horror writer who has written many short stories and series for channels on YouTube, Reddit, and TikTok. Next up, folks, I present A Symbolia by Michael Simons. Sometimes, I'm surprised by all I'm willing to endure to get what I want. It isn't just the crowds. The towering shelves of steel sheets and granite slabs make it easy to get lost here. They make it easy to feel small. Despite the high ceilings and endless aisles, I'm claustrophobic among the throngs of red-faced fathers and couples mulling over Venetian blinds. The cacophony of power saws and forklifts assaulted me, and the smell of lumber lodged itself like a splinter under the skin. I seek out the nearest employee, a younger man who's overzealous and asks too many questions. As he launches into excruciating technical details, I feel he derives a sort of sick pleasure from these displays of knowledge. He blabbers on about compression strengths and the best blends, recommending different products that he assumes I have not considered. Well, I have considered them, and I already know exactly what I want. Three bags of 40-pound concrete and a gallon of cement retarder. When people look at me, I know what they see. A short white man in his mid-thirties, wearing New Balance sneakers, paint-strewn jeans, 
a long-sleeved Oklahoma University shirt, browsing a home improvement store on the weekend. They might assume I'm married if they can't see my bare fingers. They might look at the items in my cart and think I was grabbing extra supplies for a project I was already in the middle of. Unremarkable. That's the conclusion they would reach as the blinders descend on their eyes, their perception of me immediately limited. They would never know what I've done, or what I plan to do. I stay aware of my surroundings, eyes peeled for anybody I might know. If someone were to see me, they might ask me about my purchases and my weekend. I would have to give my cover story, adding another lie to the tower I've been building my whole life knowing that each new brick could be the one to bring it all down. It can be exhausting keeping up the facade, but it can also be exciting. I felt the same excitement playing hide-and-seek as a child, that feeling of being stuck in one place, trying to make yourself as invisible as possible. You became removed from the world at that moment, not knowing how much time had passed or where the others were. It was just you and your lone mission to disappear. The self-checkout line is moving faster than I expected. Only two more people are in front of me when I feel the first twinge of arousal. I pull my shirt down as far as possible and hope my jeans will hide anything obvious. Once I reach the register, I scan my items and finish paying before rolling the card out into the parking lot. I notice my hand tremors as I take my keys and unlock my car. I load the bags into the trunk and cover them with a blanket before I climb into the front seat and start the engine. I smile as I hear the roar. I've made it. I look back at the store and get excited again. People coming and going, carrying lumber, plants, and paint out in the open, unafraid. They'd go home and have a normal weekend. They'd complete their normal projects. They'd work on their normal hobbies. None of them would pass by my car and think that within it sat a man with an erection. None of them would drive past my house and guess that, behind my backyard fence, I had a cement mixer on the edge of my patio and a small plastic pool sitting on the lawn below it. And none of them would imagine, would even allow their minds to wander far enough to imagine, that within my head I was consumed by a singular thought, covering myself head to toe in every last drop of that concrete. I can trace it all back to when I was around 12 or 13, a girl, a pool party, and a game of chicken. We had just lost a round, our opponent giving one final push, sending the girl atop my shoulders tumbling backwards, bringing me down with her. She failed to unhook her knees as we began to sink. I immediately felt like I was drowning, struggling under the strength of the girl's thighs. She was halfway to the pool's surface before she let go of me and I could swim up, at last, gasping for breath. I got out of the pool and dried myself off, hands shaking from adrenaline and all the other fight-or-flight hormones that had just been released. Later, in bed that night, thinking back on the incident, all I could remember was the sensation of drowning and the weight of the girl's thighs holding me down. It... it made me hard. I would try to recreate the scenario in our pool when my parents were absent, I'd grab a few workout weights, wrap them in a towel, drape them around my neck, and jump in. As I drifted to the bottom, I'd let out air bubbles and all thoughts of the world above ground. The crushes, the unfinished homework, my parents' divorce. They would all float away. Once at the bottom, I would untie my swimming shorts and begin... Instead of thinking about my crush, I would close my eyes and focus on the sensations around me. I would listen to the sounds of the muffled world outside. I'd feel the water slosh through the new hairs growing all over my body. I'd treasure the weight of the towel keeping me submerged. I was in a world of my own making, 
body free from gravity and mind free from angst. Each time I did it, I would push myself further, growing my lung capacity and learning to capitulate my body's rhythm. Eventually, I was able to time it just right so that I could finish in one breath and make it back to the top before my vision darkened. One day, my father arrived home earlier than usual and stepped into the backyard. The first thing he saw was my green swim shorts floating, no sun in sight. I could hear my father shout my name and begin to run towards the pool. I tossed the weights off my shoulder and broke into a breaststroke for a bit before pushing myself up to the surface. I told him I was just exercising. As soon as he realized I wasn't hurt, he could barely hide the waves of confusion and then disgust that overcame his face. He didn't say much, just that I should keep my shorts on the next time I was exercising, and then he walked away. He never brought up the incident again. Once I was in college, I found sex with women satisfying enough, but never completely fulfilling. I began to branch out, trying different things like being handcuffed or whipped. They were fun, but I knew there was more I wanted. I got closer one day when a few friends and I were out mudding. The guys decided to play a prank on me and threw me face first into a pit. The mud was deeper than they expected, and I started to sink, not knowing how deep I would go. My friends all ran off to get help, and in their absence, as I lay sinking deeper, I could feel the old fight-or-flight hormones come rushing back. I could barely open my eyes because the mud was covering my face, and I could barely hear with my ears clogged. I couldn't move lest I sink faster. All I could do was listen to my heartbeat and focus on the sensations around me. Immediately, I became aroused. The guys eventually came to my rescue, pulling me out with a broken limb they found. The small relief I felt after being saved was overshadowed by a new determination. I had to return to the quarry alone. I began taking trips to the quarry until the end of college. I would tie a rope around my waist, secure it to a tree, and wade into the mud. I would lower myself into it until all of me had been fully submerged. The world disappeared, more so than in the water. You can't hear a thing in the mud. Once again, all my worries and thoughts evaporated. For a few minutes, I was beyond human, or as human as human can be. I was a body made up entirely of nerve endings, all gearing up to fire in unison. And I was alone. And how sweet that was to be so fulfilled by these hormones, just these chemicals in the body and nerves, all my own. The mud, like the water, eventually lost its magic. Throughout my 20s, I continued to experiment with different substances and pinpoint my desires. For example, I loved autoerotic asphyxiation but also wanted the submersion. I began using a mixture of bentonite clay and water in my bathtub. It was smoother than the mud, and although I missed the thrill of possibly being discovered like at the quarry, I could recreate the asphyxiation under more controlled conditions. I began to crave the feeling of clay hardening on the skin, which led to a new substance, wax. Although I couldn't fully submerge myself in the wax, it provided something the others didn't. Pain. I rotated between these different substances for years before I decided it was time to try something new. I pour the cement into the rusty mixer while wearing an N95 mask before grabbing the garden hose. I don't measure the amount of water I add, but stop once it has the thickness of cake batter. Next, I pour in the retarder, which stops the cement from hardening too quickly. Of course, this doesn't make it completely safe. I know I'm working with man-made chemicals, with the materials our roads are made of, the basis of our infrastructure. But, 
like with the quarry or a game of chicken, there's always going to be a risk. Once the concrete finishes mixing, I place the running hose near the pool so I can rinse it off afterward. I climb back up on the patio, tie a rope to the handle of the mixer, and thread it down to the metal chair below. I go through a mental checklist. The hose is running, and I have a bottle of soap nearby. I look around the fencing. I'd already made sure both my neighbors were away for the weekend, but they could always return early, as I knew all too well. I shake off the intrusive thoughts. Even if someone were to see me, I wouldn't stop. Nobody could ruin this for me. I refuse to be shamed. I begin to strip down and put on a pair of swimming trunks, some goggles, and waterproof earplugs before sitting in the cool metal chair. With my arms covered in goosebumps, I take a deep breath and pull the rope as hard as I can. I hear a clank and the sloshing sound of cement crawling out of the mixer. I look up, and within seconds, a cascade of gray falls on my head, runs down my face, and coats my entire body. The liquid is heavy on my shoulders, encasing every open crevice with its grit and musk. I am stripped of my senses. I am pure nerve endings, both the pain and the pleasure. I'm a sensation. I am energy. Beyond the wax, the clay, the mud, the roads, the houses, the pools, the girls and boys, and the sex, I am beyond mind, beyond heart. I am beyond an I, and beyond, and beyond. The cleanup went quicker than expected. Once the last trickles of cement fell, the man realized he had lost track of time, but he didn't care. He didn't care about the stray globs of hardening concrete that littered his lawn, and he didn't care that he had broken the mixer from pulling the handle too hard. He was in another realm for the rest of the day, cleaning, cooking, and relaxing, until he sank into his bed and fell asleep. It was the middle of the night when the man awoke, his head throbbing in pain. He slid off the bed and tried to stand, but the second he put weight onto his feet, a thousand burning needles shot through his legs. He forced himself towards the medicine cabinet and reached for the aspirin. As his skin stretched out, he felt the same pain in his arms. He held them up to his eyes for inspection. They were covered in splotches of red like scarlet fever. He pulled up the legs of his pajamas and discovered the same. Next, he removed his shirt, revealing more patches in various shapes and contours. An illustrated man. His shoulders were the worst, covered in what looked like a sunburn that had started peeling. He reached out to touch the spot. It was as if his finger was a blade, the pain immediate and piercing. After looking up how to treat his burns, the man took the rest of his clothes off, found two gallons of vinegar in the pantry, brought them to the bathtub, and got in. When he began to pour the first gallon over his head, slowly at first, he felt a mixture of cool relief and burning all at once. The pain was worse when he poured over his shoulders. He watched as small skin flakes slinked off and fell into the vinegar pooling below. Once the man had emptied both gallons, he turned on the cold water and let the tub fill. As the solution rose, he felt like he was lying on a bed of hot coals. He looked down at his penis. It was not much pinker than usual. It hardened as he looked at it. He held it in his hand and began to stroke it. With the bathtub full, he lowered his entire head into it. Underwater, the man could hear his heartbeat, and he began to stroke harder. He was a conductor, his body the conduit of an orchestra of sensations, all building up to one final crescendo. When the man finished, he rose from the solution, breathless. 
The liquid around him had turned a light red-brown, now speckled by a few white milky globs as pieces of loose skin floated near the top. He got out of the bathtub and dried himself off, gently. He rubbed aloe vera over his shoulders and covered them in a large bandage. He grabbed the bottle of aspirin and set it on the nightstand, along with a glass of water. He slept naked for the rest of the night. The next morning, the man was woken by the sound of his neighbor cutting the grass. His entire body was throbbing. He took off his sheets and looked at his shoulders. The raw blister had grown and spread past the outline of the bandages. The man began to pick at the edge of the bandage near his clavicle until he caught a corner. He took a deep breath and began to lift. As he raised the bandage, slimy chunks of what was underneath clung to the adhesive. The man stopped pulling. As he held the bandage in limbo, he peered into the space between the dressing and his shoulder, bearing witness to what had always been a part of him yet had never been seen. With his left hand, he reached into the cavity and touched. He felt an immediate scorching, like his own finger was branding him. The man then took a breath, closed his eyes, and pulled. The compress ripped right off along with a three-inch strip of his shoulder. The man whimpered, sucking air through his teeth before regaining control over his breath. He looked at the bandage, strewn with skin and blood and goo, and he smiled. Over the rest of his body, the man noticed small blisters had formed during the night. Some bubbled with pus, and others had already popped. Their fluid oozed out, leaving raw skin exposed underneath. The man closed his eyes and focused on the searing pain radiating through him. Briefly, he considered going to the hospital. If they could do anything at all, they would only be able to remove the pain, leaving him a bandaged mess in a hospital bed. He would have to sit there for days. He would have to come up with new explanations and weave a new web of lies. Then, after his body healed and the pain was gone, the only thing he would be left with would be shame. The pain was essential to him now. It occupied every nook and cranny of his cognitive processes, leaving no vacancy for the stuff of his old life. Politics, work, family, friends. These social constructions were a distraction from what truly mattered, and he could see that now. It was this, his skin, his nerves, his muscles and bones, and the signals they sent to his brain. This was all he wanted. It was a pure, undistilled experience. This was life. He continued to smile as he got off the bed and tried to stand, the needles sinking deeper into his legs. He changed his clothes and put on a hoodie to cover the blisters running up and down his arms. He slid on his jeans from yesterday and savored the feel of the rough denim against his legs. He grabbed his keys and left the house on his way to the home improvement store. He picked up the same cement there and waited in the same line as yesterday. Today, it was longer. When he arrived home, he took his materials straight to the backyard. He emptied the bags and poured water into his mixer, adding even less this time. He began to spin it by hand since he had broken the handle yesterday. Once it had finished mixing, he stepped down from the patio and took off his clothes. Several more blisters had erupted, and skin continued to peel off in slimy strips. He was beginning to look more like an écorché than a man. He imagined himself on display in an art class, posing nude for the students. He could show them what was underneath it all, force them to confront themselves, their underlying musculature, blood, fat, and pus. He sat on the metal chair in the kiddie pool underneath the mixer and looked up, this time without his goggles. He took the rope in one hand and his member in the other and pulled. 
The cement took its time to crawl out of the mixer, and globs of it landed on his skin with a heaviness, irritating his open wounds. He began to scream as the cement bore down through his rawest parts, creating craters in his pink flesh. As it slid down his body, its abrasive nature began to scrape off the small amounts of healthy skin that he had left. The pain he felt was beyond anything he had ever experienced. His eyes, ears, and mouth had all been stuffed. He was deprived of all his senses except the escalating pain. He experienced each passing second as something endless, not able to imagine how things could get worse until the next second arrived. The pain was mingled with the purest ecstasy he had ever felt. Just as he could hear his heartbeat beginning to slow down and the darkness around him somehow getting darker, he climaxed. With his eruption, he could feel his ego, his mind, his very consciousness dissolve under the weight of the hardening concrete as his body continued to writhe. When the police discovered him three days later, the cement had finished drying. He was completely encased, save for his feet. Statuesque, the man had been frozen with his head lolled back and mouth agape, like Laucon. Although the man had no previous mental health incidents, they ruled it a suicide attempt, albeit a creative one, and did not pursue the case any further. His friends and family had no clue why he would do something like that, but the police who were there on the scene that day could see it all in his mouth. Agony and ecstasy. Their own faces were overcome by confusion and disgust. They did not say much to each other except for one officer, who remarked, I would have at least left my shorts on. You've just heard A Symbolia by Michael Simons. And now, to close out our evening, I give you Middle Class Christmas by Tim MacDonald. The hills of home were hewn with gray, 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 haunting gray. Their house stood silent, still upon the hill. It never sold, perhaps because my parents had taken their own lives, each with a twenty-two pistol, facing each other cross-legged in the living room with blinds closed two years ago. I received a letter. The night's darkness deepened this drowning feeling, this sinking, gloomy feeling, like crows watching from overhead singing eerie dirges, this air of imminent death. I went home to fulfill a promise, one so black and twisted it remained to be seen if I could do what those before me did in their darkest hour. It was Christmas Eve, and in the black of the night I went to the canyon, and trepidation crept up. The canyon, caustic like his own cancerous mind, cascaded down, down, down to a river beyond their house, the river wherein we used to play. I saw him standing statuesque on the old wooden bridge, motionless, poised to fall. How could I forget his blackness? Boots, pants, coat. His heart reached out to me, corrupting all my thoughts. I went to him. You got the letter, he said, his voice raspy as if he hadn't spoken for some time. Yes, I responded robotically. Then we'll do it in the house. Yes, I whispered. I remembered when we had been in foul moods. For months we were in foul moods. If we had ever seen too much, done too much, 
and now my parents' demons were out to destroy. We scaled the canyon walls, wading through the sagebrush as one wades through the people at an airport. Every sensation, from the touch of the harsh brush to the burning of my thighs, was distinct and powerful. These moments, these thoughts, these feelings were our last. I was a few short steps back from him, my stomach twisting and turning as do the pigs being led to the slaughterhouse. I thought of what comes next. Green, gorgeous fields. A white house with a woman, one who loves and loves to be loved, waiting, just waiting for me. He and I would be together as we envisioned as youths. Grow up, live together, play video games at night and program games during the day. And our wives would play too and love us. But that could not happen in this world. Not anymore. We reached their house, and my legs, bloated and full of trepidation as if they were served gratuitously at dinner, stopped, and my mind froze. Their house stood before me like the closed coffin that it was. There's no going back now, he said. We promised each other, and we have nothing left. What did I have? For months, I had no doubts. The marriage had collapsed. The divorce was finalized. She now wanted nothing of me, and I couldn't live without her. She had stayed with me as long as she could, but I wanted the impossible. The wife, asleep in bed, waiting with open arms after I took a night of sexual reveling with the bar floozies and ex-girlfriends. I wanted the days with her and the nights with them. And the day she said she was through, I had thought she would be back. I was her world. But I was not her world, and she never came back. I went into the house and it reeked of decay, the dust of two years' time unsettled with the door opening wide. The house was dead, and there was dread. Dread engulfed my every sense, my skin hairs prickled up, and my heart beat to the beat of the drum. A beat, a beat, a beat, a beat, a beat, a beat. And it was Christmas Eve. Well, sit here, he said. Where they were, I said. I had found them Christmas morning. I had opened the door to the horrors of blood, to two visages I could only identify by the clothes they had worn. I had vomited and closed the door quickly, but the image was forever lodged. My father slumped against the wall, cross-legged. My mother blasted to the side. I looked now at the floor and the walls, empty save for the dust. Who would find us bloodied and unrecognizable? We sat, facing each other like they did, and we each, in turn pulled out the twenty-two pistols, those same pistols. When I went to war, I thought I was fighting a global enemy, he began. I remember it had been a hot summer day, July 14th. I was positioned in the tower. There was no fan, only a little space to move and no time to take a shit or a piss. I just had to watch. He shook his head slowly from side to side as if he could scarcely believe what he was about to say. 
It was early afternoon. I'd been up there for five fucking hours. And then a little boy came out of the market, and the sun lit up his face. And I remember him looking right up at me. And then he walked, with his eyes squinting from the sun, towards the base. I yelled for him to stop, but he didn't. And you know what I did? I put a bullet into his head. And you know what? There was no bomb. Nothing. My first kill. It was easier after that. A woman with a strange backpack, a man wearing a cast, the list goes on. A license to kill. I had smiled at the faces of the dead. Now it's their turn to smile. And then he paused. When the world offers you nothing, we each in turn offer nothing back, I said. Then on three, he said. And then, to my horror, we both put the guns to our heads. The sweat poured from my hands, my legs, my body. But he was stone, set on destruction. Hollowed face, shallow voice, cold heart. But for me, the passing of passivity had begun. I remembered them. Tortured minds, bullets ending everything. They left me to grieve, to wonder. Three, two, he began. What had it been? Financial ruin? Gambling debts? A lost mortgage? I couldn't remember. Their credit cards had been scattered about them. They left me with their debt, their demons, but more so questions. So many questions and no answers. I thought of her and what questions I would leave her. One. Wait, I said. He pulled the trigger. His last action, shedding the tears he couldn't before let go. A simple movement of his finger that ended it all. I saw green. Gorgeous fields turned to smoke. A white house turned to ash. A woman who loves and loves to be loved, to turn to blood. And us. I saw us. Him turning down and me turning away. I will someday know what he saw, but he will never know what I saw. You've been listening to Middle Class Christmas by Tim McDonald. Well, my friends, that wraps things up tonight. Three tales from three authors, and I might have to stretch my neck a bit from the whiplash. That being said, with this being the last show of 2023, it's nice to close out with a bang. I'd like to thank J.H. Salem, Michael Simons, and Tim McDonald for providing our stories this evening. And, as always, listeners, thank you for joining me. What a lovely way to watch the blood run out of 2023. Until next time, friends, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. 
seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising. I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Chirey's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.